Hi guys, here is Dr. Benaduce. Today we start studying the muscular tissue. In the tissues chapter, I told you that in our body we have four main types of tissues. Do you remember their names? They were epithelial tissue, connective tissue, nervous tissue, and muscular tissue. When we dive in deep into muscular tissue, we see that we have three different types of muscles. And they are named smooth muscle, skeletal muscle, and cardiac muscle. And these three different types of muscles are found in different places of our body. And when we look at these three different types of muscles under a light microscope, we can see that they are different. They look different. So we have a structural difference between these three different types of muscles. And also the way these three different types of muscles work is slightly different. And I will go over the main differences we have between smooth muscle, skeletal muscle, and cardiac muscle in this lecture. But besides these differences, they are all within the muscular tissue category. And with that in mind, you can expect that they have common properties. And there are four special properties that we find in the muscular tissue, that we find in smooth muscle, skeletal muscle, and cardiac muscle. And these properties are excitability, contractility, extensibility, and elasticity. Now, what do you believe the word excitability means? This means that a muscle cell can be excited. And I told you in the nervous tissue class that in our body, we only have two cell types that are excitable. And they are muscle cells and nerve cells. Now, do you remember what means to be excitable? Being excitable means that muscle cells and nerve cells can go from being polarized cells to being depolarized cells. A polarized cell is the cell that has the inside of the cell more negative in relationship to the outside environment. And that's what we call resting membrane potential. Now, nerve cells and muscle cells are capable of reverting the polarity. So we have muscle cells and nerve cells when stimulated, they go from being more negative on the inside to being more positive on the inside when compared to the outside. And when that happens, we say that the muscle cell or the nerve cell is depolarized. And this change in voltage is what we call an electrical signal. That is an action potential. So we have muscle cells and nerve cells being excitable. They are excitable cells. Consequently, they have the property of excitability. Now, when muscle cells are excited, how do they respond to this stimulus? They contract. And that is what we call contractility. Congratulations. Now, we know that besides contracting our muscles, we can also stretch our muscles. And the property of a tissue to be able to be stretched without the cells getting damaged is what we call extensibility. So extensibility is the property that our muscle cells have that allows them to be extended, obviously within limits, and not get damaged. Now, after a muscle cell is extended or it is contracted, we know this muscle cell is capable of going back to its original shape and length. And this capability of going back to the original length and shape after it contracted or after it extended is what we call elasticity. Now, let's take a look at the differences we have between smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, and skeletal muscle. And the first thing we need to remember is that the great majority of our muscle cells develop from the mesoderm, which is one of the three embryonic germ layers. Remember, we have ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm. The great majority of our muscle cells come from the mesoderm, but we also have some muscle cells that end up turning into smooth muscle that come from the ectoderm. That's why we cannot say all muscle cells come from the mesoderm, but the great majority of them do. So what happens is that cells in the mesoderm germ layer receive signals to differentiate into 
myoblasts. Now, guys, with the root blasts in it, you can expect that myoblasts are the cells born to build muscle because myo means muscle. And depending on the signals these myoblasts receive, they will turn into smooth muscle cells, cardiac muscle cells, or skeletal muscle cells. And the first thing we can notice is that smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, and skeletal muscle look different. But one thing the three of them have in common in their appearance, and what they have in common is that the muscle cells are long. They are elongated in the smooth muscle. They are elongated in the cardiac muscle. And they are extremely long in the skeletal muscle. And since these cells are long, they look like fibers. And that's the reason we say muscle fiber. So every single time you hear muscle fiber, muscle cell, or myocyte, Remember, the root site means cell and the root myo means muscle. We are referring to the same thing. They are all synonyms. If we focus in the smooth muscle appearance, we can see that besides these cells being long, they have this spindle shape and every single cell has a nucleus. So we have a single nucleus inside each cell. And we have cells touching each other, but we also have cells that do not touch another cell. And in the cells that are touching another cell, we will find gap junctions between those cells. And gap junctions is a type of cell junction that we discussed in the tissues chapter. Now, if we compare the smooth muscle appearance with the cardiac muscle and skeletal muscle appearance, we can clearly see that the smooth muscle does not have striations like we see in the cardiac and skeletal muscles. And because the smooth muscle does not have striations, it looks smooth. That is this smooth appearance. And that's why the smooth muscle was named smooth. Now, where do we find smooth muscle? We find smooth muscle in the wall of our blood vessels in the wall of our esophagus, in the wall of our stomach, in the wall of our intestines. And basically, we find smooth muscle in the wall of hollow organs. And all these examples I mentioned, can you control that muscle? Can you voluntarily contract your stomach? Can you voluntarily decrease the diameter of your blood vessels by contracting the smooth muscle in the wall of your blood vessels? No, you cannot. And that tells you that smooth muscle is under involuntary control. We cannot consciously control smooth muscle. And if we cannot consciously control it, it is automatically controlled by our nervous system. And that means that the smooth muscle is under autonomic control. Now, besides the smooth muscle being controlled by the autonomic nervous system, we also have hormones released by endocrine glands controlling the smooth muscle contraction. And we will talk more about that when we go over the different systems we have in our body. Now, when we focus in the cardiac muscle, we can see that these cells have striations. But if we compare with the striations we are seeing in the skeletal muscle, they are not as prominent in cardiac muscle. Now, another thing we can see in the cardiac muscle is that, as we mentioned before, the cells are long, and we can see that cells are communicating between themselves. And this communication between cardiac muscle cells is done by intercalated discs. And intercalated discs are extremely important. And the components of intercalated discs are two cell junctions we studied in the tissues chapters. In the intercalated discs, we find desmosomes and we find gap junctions. Desmosomes are there because they will hold the muscle cells together. 
And gap junctions are there because they will make very easy for the electrical signal that is in one cardiac muscle cell to flow to the next cardiac muscle cell. And this will lead to a wave-like contraction that will allow the heart to contract in a wave-like motion, which will eject the blood in the specific direction it needs to be ejected. So these intercalated discs that we have between cardiac muscle cells are extremely important and they are made by desmosomes and gap junctions. Now I have a question for you. Can you control how many times your heart beat in a minute? No, you cannot. You cannot control cardiac muscle contraction voluntarily. And if you cannot control it voluntarily, it is controlled automatically. Now, there is a caveat for cardiac muscle. Cardiac muscle makes up the heart wall. And in the heart, we have special cardiac muscle cells that are capable of depolarizing on their own. And those cells are called pacemaker cells. And we'll talk deeply about them when we go over the heart later on in the semester. And these pacemaker cells, they are capable of depolarizing on their own. And they depolarize in a specific amount of times per minute. So our heart itself can contract because the stimulus is within the heart itself. It does not need any outside stimulus. However, our nervous system can modulate how many times a minute our heart contracts. And that's why if we are nervous, our heart beats more times per minute. If we are very calm and meditating, our heart beats less times per minute. So we can have the nervous system automatically modulating how many times our heart beats per minute. So we can say that even though the stimulus for the cardiac muscle cells to contract comes from special cardiac muscle cells found in the heart muscle, our autonomic nervous system has the power to modulate how many times per minute our heart contracts. So, at this moment, we know that smooth muscle makes up the wall of hollow organs and we do not have control over it. We know that cardiac muscle is found in the heart and we also do not have voluntary control over it. And we have a third type of muscle that's called the skeletal muscle. Now, guys, with the name is skeletal, where do you think we will find this skeletal muscle? We will find the skeletal muscle attaching to our skeleton. And the skeletal muscle is what will allow our bones to move, our skeleton to move. Now, can you control the muscles that allow your skeleton to move? Are you capable of controlling the muscles that allow you to walk? Are you capable of controlling the muscles that allow you to handwrite? Yes, you are. So, skeletal muscle is the muscle that we have voluntary control over. We can consciously and voluntarily control our skeletal muscles. Now, since we know that smooth muscle cells and cardiac muscle cells have a single nucleus, we can see that based on these diagrams, I have here five smooth muscle cells and I have five cardiac muscle cells. Now, if we take a look at the skeletal muscle, can you see that we have one, two, three, four, five nuclei? Guys, all these nuclei that we are seeing here are part of one single skeletal muscle cell. This that we are seeing here is a segment, is a little piece of one single skeletal muscle cell. Skeletal muscle cells are formed by the fusion of several myoblasts. And every single skeletal muscle cell has several nuclei. That's why we say that skeletal muscle cells are multinucleated. They have a multi, multitude of nuclei in them. And we have cells that have hundreds and hundreds of nuclei. And they are, as you can expect, 
extremely long. They are much longer than smooth muscle cells. They are much longer than cardiac muscle cells. As I mentioned, these that you're seeing right here is a small segment, is a little piece of one single skeletal muscle cell. Skeletal muscle cells need to be as long as the muscle that they are making up. So, if you take into consideration the rectus femoris muscle, which is a muscle that we have in the anterior aspect of our thigh, and the rectus femoris muscle it starts at the hip bone and it finishes at the tibia bone, so it crosses the femur in the anterior aspect. Guys, every single skeletal muscle cell making up the rectus femoris muscle needs to be as long as the rectus femoris muscle. So, Skeletal muscle cells can be as long as 30 centimeters, for example. They are extremely long and they have several nuclei. And every single one of these nucleus that we have in the skeletal muscle cell basically takes care of the cytoplasm that is around it. Now, besides having several nuclei, what we can see in this segment of a single skeletal muscle cell that I drew is that skeletal muscle cells have very prominent striations, much more prominent than the cardiac muscle cells. And that's why skeletal muscle is also referred as the striated muscle. Now, what are these striations? These striations are the contractile proteins found within the muscle cell. Because the contractile proteins found within the skeletal muscle cell and the cardiac muscle cell are arranged in such a perfect way, so organized that when these cells are looked under a light microscope, we can see these bands, these striations. And the fact that we look at the smooth muscle cells and we do not see these striations is a consequence of the contractile proteins not being arranged in such organized way. And then when we look at a smooth muscle cell under a light microscope, we cannot see the stripes. We cannot see the striations. Now, there is one last observation I would like to talk to you right now. I told you that skeletal muscle cells are extremely long. I told you that cardiac muscle cells are connected by intercalated discs. And in intercalated discs, we not only have one cell junction, we have two cell junctions. We have desmosomes and we have gap junctions. Now, keeping this information that I just said in mind, do you think it is a possible and easy task for skeletal muscle cells and cardiac muscle cells to undergo cell division. No, guys, it is not possible. It is not easy because in the case of skeletal muscle cells, they are extremely long. And in the case of cardiac muscle cells, they are connected to all the other cells that are around them by intercalated discs. And when we take this into consideration, it is very easy to remember that cell division for cardiac muscle cells and skeletal muscle cells does not happen after we are born. All cell division happens before we are born because it is very hard for a cell under those conditions we mentioned to undergo cell division. So basically what happens for cardiac muscle cells and skeletal muscle cells, all these muscle cells lose their ability to undergo cell division once they are formed. Now, when we look at the structure of the smooth muscle and we look at the smooth muscle cells, we can see that they are elongated, but they are not that long. And we can see that not all these smooth muscle cells are interconnected. Consequently, smooth muscle cells can undergo cell division after we are born. In the previous slides, I talked about the different types of muscle tissue we have. We have smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, and skeletal muscle. Smooth muscle is found in the wall of hollow organs. Cardiac muscle is found in the wall of our heart. And the skeletal muscle is found attaching to the bones in our skeleton. And also we find the skeletal muscle attaching to the skin or other muscles. Now, when we have a muscle making up the wall of a hollow organ, that muscle is part of what's making that container right? That hollow organ. Consequently, we can say that one of the muscular tissue functions is to store substances because we find muscles 
making up the wall of hollow organs. For example, we find smooth muscle making up the wall of the stomach. And the stomach is basically a muscular sac that holds all the food we swallow. Now, let's imagine that the muscle that we have making up the wall of the stomach contracts. What will happen with whatever is inside the stomach? Whatever is inside the stomach will move around, correct? And that's how you do to remember that one of the functions of our muscular tissue is to store and move substances within the body. And another example that makes this function of the muscular tissue very easy to remember is by remembering that our heart wall is made of cardiac muscle, so it's muscular tissue. And within our heart, we find blood. And every time our heart muscle cells contract, it moves blood out of the heart. So it pumps blood out of the heart into the blood vessels. So obviously, our heart is another very good example that we can use to remember that one of the functions of our muscle tissue is to move substances within the body. Another function of the muscular tissue is voluntary body movement. And obviously, when we're talking about voluntary body movement, we are talking about skeletal muscle. Because the skeletal muscle is the only muscle type that we have voluntary control over. Voluntary body movements include running, walking, handwriting. Any movement we can voluntarily perform. Now, have you noticed that if you are standing up, you're not really thinking about the contraction of your lower limb muscles. If you're standing up or if you're sitting down, you're not really thinking about the contraction of the muscles in your torso so you can have posture. That's basically happening automatically. And that is, in fact, another function of the muscular tissue, which is specific of the skeletal muscle type. The maintenance of body posture. Now, let's say you decided to... Start exercising, right? So you're exercising, and after a certain amount of time, you start sweating. What is the sweating? Sweating is a way our body has to help us cool down. Now, you only started sweating because your internal body temperature was higher than what it should be. And what caused the increase in your body temperature was the muscle contraction, because muscle contraction produces heat. And because you're exercising, you are producing heat, and the heat production caused your body temperature to increase, and then your body now needs to sweat so it can cool down. That's the way you can do to remember that another function of the muscular tissue is heat production. And when we are not exercising, every time our muscles contract, heat is being generated. And our body uses this heat to keep our internal body temperature within homeostatic levels. And when you are in a cold environment and you start shivering, that is your body forcing you to contract your skeletal muscles to produce heat. And with that, you keep your internal body temperature within homeostatic levels. When we look at the smooth muscle, we can find it organized in two different ways. The smooth muscle cells can be organized as a single unit or they can be organized as a multi-unit. As the name implies, a single unit smooth muscle is the one that, when stimulated, will contract as a single unit. Now, if this smooth muscle cells will contract as a single unit, that means that these muscle cells are joined by gap junctions. So the action potential that is one cell can quickly go to the next cell and then these cells can all contract as a single unit. Now in the multi-unit smooth muscle, guys, look at the name, multi-unit. You have multi, a multitude of units. You have the smooth muscle cells not connected one to another. 
It is extremely rare to find gap junctions between the smooth muscle cells in the multi-unit smooth muscle. It is so rare that we usually say that there are no gap junctions between the smooth muscle cells that are in the multi-unit smooth muscle. And if they do not have gap junctions, they are not electrically coupled. So when one smooth muscle cell contracts, that cannot spread to the other cell that's next to it. So in the multi-unit smooth muscle, we have every single cell contracting when that specific cell is stimulated, but not because the stimulus came from another smooth muscle cell that was right next to it, because the cells are not communicating via gap junctions. And because of this arrangement, we have every single cell in the multi-unit smooth muscle contracting only when they are specifically stimulated. Now, where would be useful to have the single unit smooth muscle and the multi unit smooth muscle? Guys, the single unit smooth muscle is useful where we need to have a single cell contracting and as a consequence, all the other cells contract and we have all this smooth muscle in that organ contracting as a single unit. And we find the single unit smooth muscle in the walls of all visceral organs with the exception of the heart that has cardiac muscle in the wall. And since the smooth muscle in a single unit is found in the wall of basically all visceral organs, the single unit smooth muscle is the one that's commonly called visceral muscle. And what is very interesting is that since we find the single unit smooth muscle in the wall of hollow organs, besides we having the autonomic nervous system telling the cells to contract, we also have the stretching of the hollow organ happening and causing the stimulation of the smooth muscle cell in this single unit. And when we have the stimulus coming from the inside the muscle itself, because, for example, it got stretched, that is called myogenic. Genic because it is generated in myo muscle. So it was generated within the muscle because of the stretching of the hollow organ wall. Now, we also have this single unit smooth muscle answering to hormones. And the easy way to remember that the single unit smooth muscle answer to hormones is by remembering that the single unit smooth muscle is present in the uterine wall. Now, guys, the uterus is an organ in the female reproductive system. Females have uterus because babies develop inside the uterus. And the uterus has a very thick muscle wall. And when it's time for the birth of the baby, what happens? Contractions happen. Contractions happen to push the baby out. Now, with this in mind, would it be useful to have single unit smooth muscle in the uterine wall or a multi-unit smooth muscle in the wall? Guys, we need to have a single unit smooth muscle in the uterine wall because we need the whole uterus contracting as a single unit to push the baby out. If we had multi-unit smooth muscle in the uterine wall, we would need to have several stimulus making every single cell in the smooth muscle contracting at the same time to push the baby out. So no, it cannot happen. In the uterine wall, we need to have a single unit smooth muscle. Now, the single unit smooth muscle in the uterine wall is controlled by hormones. And the name of the hormone is specifically oxytocin. And when the oxytocin stimulates the single unit smooth muscle in the uterine wall to contract, the uterine wall contracts smooth and slowly. And I say smooth to make a reference to the smooth muscle and slowly because it's much slower than the contraction of a cardiac muscle or the skeletal muscle. So the single unit smooth muscle contracts smooth and slowly, but this contraction is extremely powerful, powerful enough to push the baby out. So remembering the uterus as an example of a single unit smooth muscle because the uterus needs to contract as a single unit to push the baby out, you can remember that the single unit smooth muscle is found in the wall of hollow organs. You can remember that the single unit smooth muscle has smooth and slow contractions, but they are extremely powerful. And you can remember that the single unit smooth muscle can be controlled by hormones. Now, besides being controlled by hormones, the single unit smooth muscle can be controlled by the mechanical stress caused by the stretching of the wall of hollow organs. 
which is what we call myogenic because it was generated within the muscle. And also the smooth muscle organized in a single unit can be controlled by the nervous system. And when a muscle is controlled by the nervous system, we call neurogenic. The control is generated by the neural nervous system. Now, other examples of hollow organs besides the uterus would be blood vessels. We have single unit smooth muscle in the wall of our blood vessels. We have single unit smooth muscle in the wall of our urinary bladder. We have single unit smooth muscle in the wall of the organs of our alimentary canal. The alimentary canal, as we will cover in the digestive system, is the canal that the food we swallow passes. It is basically a tube that starts at the mouth and finishes at the anus. And all the organs in the alimentary canal have smooth muscle organized as a single unit in their walls. So when a smooth muscle cell in the single unit smooth muscle is stimulated, these stimulus pass to the cells that are right next to it because these cells in the single unit smooth muscle are connected by gap junctions. And when we have this stimulus spreading to the cells that are right next to it, we have these cells then contracting and that will push, will move the partially digested or digested food along the alimentary canal. And as it's shown in this diagram, the stomach, which is one of the organs that we have in the alimentary canal, has smooth muscle organized as a single unit in the wall. And when we study the stomach in the digestive system, I will show you that in the stomach wall, we have three smooth muscle layers. And these three smooth muscle layers are arranged in different directions, so our stomach can have the most amazing contractions in all different directions possible. Now, the other type of smooth muscle we have is the multi-unit smooth muscle. And as I mentioned before, the multi-unit is the one that has a multitude of units. The smooth muscle cells are not talking to each other, and each individual cell needs to receive the stimulus to be able to contract. And what stimulates each smooth muscle cell in the multi-unit smooth muscle is a specific neuron. And if a smooth muscle cell responds to commands coming from neurons, we say that that specific smooth muscle is under neurogenic control. And the multi-unit smooth muscle is found in very specific places of our body. The multi-unit smooth muscle is found in our eyes, specifically in the colorful muscle of our eyes, which is named iris. And when the iris contracts and relaxes, it changes the size of the pupil, which is the hole we have exactly in the middle of our eye. And the size of the pupil is what allows more or less light to go into our eyeball. Another place we find multi-unit smooth muscle is in the ciliary body of our eyes. And the ciliary body is what controls how stretched or relaxed the lens in our eyes are. So basically, we have multi-unit smooth muscle controlling the accommodation of our eyes. Also, the multi-unit smooth muscle is the type of muscle that gives us goosebumps. Remember when we studied the erector piline muscle when we went over the integumentary system? So yes, the erector piline muscle is a multi-unit smooth muscle. And lastly, I need you guys to remember that we have multi-unit smooth muscle in the wall of very large blood vessels and also in the wall of very small airwaves. And it's very important to have the multi-unit smooth muscle in these two places because we really need to have a fine control of when the muscles making up the wall of small airways contract and also when the smooth muscle making up the wall of very large blood vessels contract. And with that in mind, you can remember that the multi-unit smooth muscle can be only controlled by the nervous system. It has only neurogenic control. Now, independently of the smooth muscle being organized in a single unit or in a multi-unit, we see that the cells in the smooth muscle have this spindle shape. They are elongated and we do not see striations. And the reason why we do not see striations is because the contractile proteins, the thin filaments and the thick filaments are not arranged in a very organized way, as I drew in this diagram. So we have here the relaxed smooth muscle cell. And in the relaxed smooth muscle cell, I drew the thick and thin filaments. 
which are the contractile proteins named myosin and actin. Myosin is the thick filament and the actin is the thin filament. Myosin is the one in green and actin is the one in purple. Now, what happens is that the actin thin filament is attached to the dense bodies of the smooth muscle cell. And the dense bodies are these little balls that you are seeing that basically serve as anchoring points for the actin filaments. And the dense bodies are all interconnected by the intermediate filaments. And that is very important for the way that the smooth muscle cells contract. Now, we have the thick myosin filament and the thin actin filament. And the way contraction happens is by the myosin pulling on the actin. So let's imagine that here we have the myosin thick filament and we have like the myosin head right here. And this is the magnified version of what you're seeing right here where I wrote myosin, okay? Now, when you look at that, you can expect that the thin filament acting will be, for example, right here and right here, right? Like this. And at the endings, you would find the dense bodies. Now, when we say that myosin pulls on acting, what literally is happening is that the myosin head grabs the acting and pulls in this direction. And when this happens, the acting filaments that are anchored in one dense body, for example, this one, is getting closer to the acting filament that's anchored in the other dense body. So at the end, we have the dense bodies getting closer to one another. But all dense bodies are interconnected by the intermediate filaments. And when this all happens, what we have at the end is the dense bodies all over the smooth muscle cell getting closer to one another. And since they are all interconnected by intermediate filaments, the whole cell crunches up and looks like those mesh stress balls that when you squeeze, the things go through the little holes and it looks like this. So that is the way a smooth muscle cell contracts. And in order for a smooth muscle cell to contract, we only need three things. We need a stimulus that is strong enough to stimulate that cell. So we need a threshold stimulus. We need ATP and we need calcium ions. So the recipe for contraction is a muscle cell, threshold stimulus, ATP and calcium ions. And in the skeletal muscle part of this lecture, I will tell you specifically what the ATP and the calcium ions do in muscle contraction. Cardiac muscle is the muscle that we find in the wall of our heart. Obviously, cardiac muscle is found in the heart. Now, the four heart chambers have cardiac muscle in the wall. And every single time our heart chambers contract, they need to contract in any specific direction. And this contraction needs to happen in a wave-like motion so the blood can be pumped in the direction it needs to be pumped. If the heart muscle cells are contracting all over the place in no order like a wave-like motion contraction, our heart will not be able to pump the blood in the direction it needs to be pumped. And with that in mind, you can conclude that all our heart muscle cells will need to be connected one to another, one to another. And these connections happen via intercalated discs. And intercalated discs have two cell junctions. We have in the intercalated discs desmosomes, which will work like Velcro and will connect the two cells that are side by side. And we have also in the intercalated discs, gap junctions. And gap junctions, as the name implies, they are gaps at the junction. And these gaps at the junction between cells will allow the electrical impulse that is in one cell to quickly flow to the next cell. And this quick flow of the electrical signal, of the action potential from one cell to the next cell is what will allow our heart chambers to contract in a wave-like motion. And for a cardiac muscle cell to contract, we need an stimulus, we need ATP and calcium ions. So the same recipe that we need for the smooth muscle cells and for the skeletal muscle cells to contract. Now, for the cardiac muscle cells to contract, the stimulus comes from the cells that are within the heart. 
and these cells are specialized cardiac muscle cells. So we have cardiac muscle cells telling the other cardiac muscle cells to contract. And with that in mind, you can conclude that cardiac muscle cells are under myogenic control. The control is generated by myo, by muscle cells. Now, as I mentioned before, our nervous system can modulate how many times a minute our heart contracts. But the nervous system does not stimulate the contraction of the heart muscle cells, of the cardiac muscle cells. So, for cardiac muscle, we have only myogenic control. And now, it's time for us to talk about the skeletal muscle. Previously, when I introduced you to the smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, and skeletal muscle, I told you that this that I drew is a segment, is a little piece of a skeletal muscle cell. Because skeletal muscle cells are extremely long. They are basically the length of the muscle that we are looking at. So, since we have muscles that are a feet long, the skeletal muscle cells making up that muscle will be a feet long. So, in reality, we would need to extend this skeletal muscle cell right here to the sides to be able to see the skeletal muscle cell in its entirety. I also told you that skeletal muscle cells come from the fusion of several myoblasts. Myoblasts are the cells that are born to build muscle, right? Now, think about the embryonic development. If you need to have cells that are extremely long, like skeletal muscle cells, it is much easier if you get precursor cells like myoblasts that will give rise to the extremely long cell and put several of them together to make then a single cell that's extremely long, then making one single myoblast to grow all the way to the sides to become extremely long. So, in reality, what happened was that the myoblasts fused and then they became this very long skeletal muscle cell. Now, if the skeletal muscle cell comes from the fusion of several myoblasts, skeletal muscle cells have several nuclei. And when a cell has several nuclei, we say that that cell is multinucleated. Multi, it has a multitude of nuclei. Now, this particular segment of a single skeletal muscle cell that I drew has one, two, three, four, five nuclei. However, even the smallest skeletal muscle cell will have hundreds of nuclei, and they are extremely long, much longer than the cardiac muscle cell or the smooth muscle cell. Now, as you can see, we have these stripes, these estriations, and that is the reason why we refer to the skeletal muscle as the estriated muscle. And these estriations are observed only because of the organized arrangement of the thick and thin filaments that we have inside of the skeletal muscle cell. Now, old days, guys, there was no electron microscope. What was available was the light microscope. And when a skeletal muscle cell was placed under a light microscope, darker bands and lighter bands were observed, and these darker and lighter bands were in a perfect pattern creating the striations. Now, wonderful, we have striations. Can we zoom in and look at them even closer? Yes, we can. So they zoomed in in the microscope, and for example, they got closer to these five striations right here, this segment of these five striations, and what they could see was this. And when this was observed, they were like, okay, we can see several units. And they are the units of the skeletal muscle cell. So they named each of these units that we are seeing here a sarcomere. Because the root mere means unit. And sarco is a Greek root that means flesh. And you need to remember that the muscle that we are seeing, the skeletal muscle, is literally the flesh. It's like the meat that when you go to the supermarket, you buy. So, that is the flesh of the body. And that's why these units were named sarcomere. They are the flesh units. And every single sarcomere unit consists of dark and light bands. That's why we say that the sarcomere is the unit of estriated muscles. Because if the muscle has estriations, we will have these darker and lighter bands. And that is what we see in each sarcomere. Now, if you pay attention, you can see that sarcomeres are arranged in lines. And between the lines, we have a little space. In this case, I drew three lines. 
And each of these lines, which is a sequence of sarcomeres, receives the name of myofibril. So in this specific drawing, I have three myofibrils. I have three lines with a sequence of sarcomeres. And we can also see that every single time a sarcomere and the other sarcomere starts. Can you see that? Yes, because they are in a sequence. And we know that the last letter in the alphabet is the letter Z. And that's how you do to remember that between sarcomeres, you have a Z line. Because every single time a sarcomere ends, the other one starts. So we have a letter Z, the last letter in the alphabet, Z, 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 defining a sarcomere unit. So we have every single sarcomere between two Z lines. Now, okay, we have Z lines defining the endings of a sarcomere. We have this sequence of sarcomeres arranged in lines called myofibrils. And we can see this all under a light microscope. Wonderful. Now, would it be possible to zoom in even further and see what is going on within sarcomeres using a light microscope? Yes. And when zooming in into a single myofibril to have a better look at a sarcomere unit, this was observed. These were the Z lines which tells us that this is a sarcomere. Now, we see that the sarcomere has this dark band right here, and we see that we have a light band that is right here. And the light band has the Z line in the middle. Now, the light band is shared between two sarcomeres. Can you see that? Because this is a sarcomere. Here, we have another sarcomere. Here we have another sarcomere, because the Z lines define a unit. It defines a sarcomere. So we have lighter bands shared by two sarcomeres, and the lighter band has the Z line in the middle. Now, what happens is that this was being observed under a light microscope. And when we see something dark, is because the light cannot go through. And when we see something light, like a light band, that means that the light could pass through. Now, we have terms to refer when light is able to pass through or it's not able to pass through. And when light is able to pass through, we refer to it as isotropic. And when light cannot pass through, we call anisotropic. Because the root an, un, means no, means without, so without light. The light cannot pass through, it will look darker. And with that in mind, they named the bands, the light band and the dark band. Obviously, the dark band is the one that the light cannot pass through. So the dark band is named A band, making a reference to anisotropic. And the light band is the band that the light can pass through. So the light band was called I band, making a reference to isotropic. Now, years passed and the electron microscope was developed. And then, with the invention of the electron microscope, it was possible to see what was really making these bands dark and light. And when a sarcomere was observed under an electron microscope, this is what was found. It was found that sarcomeres had filaments that were either thin or thick. And this thick filaments would give the darker appearance for the band. And the thin filaments would give the light appearance for the bands. Because since the filaments were thin, light could pass through. And then it was figured out that the thin filaments were made of a protein called actin. And the thick filaments had lots of a protein called myosin. And myosin and actin are the two contractile proteins in a muscle cell. Now, why do you think we call actin and myosin the contractile proteins? We call them the contractile proteins because they are the ones that will cause a contraction. And I will tell you specifically the mechanism that happens for contraction to occur. Now, at this moment, I need you to remember that actin is the protein that makes up the thin filament and myosin is the protein that makes up the thick filament. And a way you can do to remember is by remembering that the letter A for actin is much thinner than the letter M for myosin. Basically, the letter M looks like it has two letter A's, right? 
like that. So the letter M for myosin is thicker. Consequently, myosin makes up the thick filament and actin makes up the thin filament. Now we are ready to figure out what is going on in the A band and in the I band. Here we have the Z line. You see, there is the Z line and there is the Z line. And the Z lines are what define the unit in a muscle cell, which is what we call sarcomere. Now we can see that in the middle of a sarcomere, we have the A band. And by looking and comparing these two diagrams, we can see that the A band is right here. The A band is the one that the light cannot go through. It's the anisotropic one. Remember, that's why it was named A band. And now we can see why the light could not go through. The light could not go through because within the A band, we have the overlapping of actin and myosin filaments. And when the actin, thin filament, and the myosin, thick filament overlap, we have no space for the light to go through. And that made the band very dark. Consequently, it was named A band. Now, when we take a look at what was going on in the I band, we can see that the I band was right here. And in the I band, we only have actin thin filaments. And since these filaments were thin, light could go through. And if light could go through, it was called isotropic. And that's why this was named I band. So in the I band, we only have acting thin filaments. And that's the reason why light can go through. Now, can you notice that in the heart of the A band, we have an area that we do not have the overlapping of actin and myosin filaments. And in the heart of the A band, we have an area that has only myosin thick filaments. Now, if you have only myosin thick filaments, this area in the heart of the A band cannot be as dark as the areas that you have the overlapping of the actin thin filaments and the myosin thick filaments, correct? Yes, that's correct. And that's why this area in the heart of the A band is the halo area in the A band. And that's how you do to remember that in the heart of the A band, you have the halo area that's called H band. H for heart, H for halo. And in the H band, we only find myosin thick filaments. Now, in the middle of the H band, right here, we have a line. And this line has proteins that anchor the myosin thick filaments in both sides. As you can see, the proteins making up the Z line will be the ones anchoring the actin thin filaments, which are the purple ones, right? Now, here in the middle of the H band, we have proteins that anchor the myosin filaments. And since these proteins that are anchoring the myosin thick filaments are in the middle of the H band, these proteins right here make up the M line. M for middle because they are in the middle of the H band. So, as a summary, you need to remember that the Z lines make up the ends of a sarcomere, which is the muscle unit. You need to remember that the A band is the dark band, the I band is the light band. The A band is in the heart, it is in the middle of a sarcomere. And within the A band, we have the halo spot that's called H band. Now, the H band is where we find only myosin thick filaments. The A band on the side of the H band is where we have the overlapping of the actin thin filaments and myosin thick filaments. And when we look at the I band, we have only acting thin filaments. One way students like to remember the I band, H band, and A band is by remembering that I is a thin letter. So in the I band, you only find thin filaments. The H is a thick letter, much thicker than the I. And then in the H band, you only find myosin thick filaments. And in the A band, A for end. The A band is the band that you will find acting thin filaments and myosin thick filaments. So in the A band, you have the overlapping of thick and thin filaments. We know that our muscles contract. Now, what is contraction and how contraction happens? Guys, contraction is when the muscle gets shortened, right? So what happens is that for a muscle to get shortened, we have these filaments, thin filaments and thick filaments sliding over one another. 
That is how contraction happens. That is how the muscle gets shortened. And specifically what we see is that the myosin, which is the thick filament, grabs the actin, which is the thin filament, and pulls the actin thin filament towards the middle of the sarcomere, like this. Obviously, the thick one is thicker. It has much more power to pull something that is thinner. So, the thick filament will pull the thin filament. Now, remember that the actin thin filaments are anchored at the Z lines, which are the lines that define the sarcomere unit. As a consequence, when the thick filaments pull the thin filaments towards the middle of the sarcomere unit, the Z lines, which are the anchoring points for the acting thin filaments, will get closer, decreasing the whole length of the sarcomere unit. Now, we know that the Z lines are in the middle of the I band, which is the band that light could go through because that is the band that we only have the actin thin filaments. Now, if the Z lines are getting closer to each other, because the actin thin filaments are sliding over the myosin thick filaments, you can conclude that we'll have a smaller segment that has only actin thin filaments. Consequently, as the Z lines get closer to each other, there is a decrease in the thickness of the I band. Now, this part of the sarcomere where we have the overlapping of the thick and thin filaments is the A band. And in the middle of the A band, we have the halo area, which is called H band. Guys, the H band will have to decrease in size when the acting thin filaments are moved towards the middle. So, what we see in muscle contraction is this the decrease in thickness of the H band the decrease in thickness of the I band and the Z lines closer to each other. And this is exactly how every single skeletal muscle in our body contracts. We can only contract our skeletal muscles if we have the myosin thick filaments pulling the acting thin filaments towards the middle of the sarcomere. And when that happens, every single sarcomere unit decreases in length. If all sarcomere units within a myofibril decrease in length, we have the whole myofibril, which is a sequence of sarcomere units decreasing in length. And by having all myofibrils within a single skeletal muscle cell decreasing in length, we have the whole skeletal muscle cell decreasing in length. And if all skeletal muscle cells in a single skeletal muscle decrease in length, we have the whole skeletal muscle decreasing in length. And that is how we contract a skeletal muscle. And now you can understand why the mechanism for muscle contraction is called sliding filament mechanism. Because the whole contraction process depends on the actin thin filament sliding over the myosin thick filament. Now, the actin thin filament only slides over the myosin thick filament when the myosin pulls the actin. And that only happens when we have calcium and ATP available. So, as I mentioned to you when we were talking about the smooth muscle, the recipe for contraction is a muscle cell, a threshold stimulus, calcium ions, and ATP. And now I'll explain to you why we need a threshold stimulus, calcium ions, and ATP. When we zoom in and we take a look at the thin and thick filaments, we see that the thick filament is composed of a protein called myosin, and that's why we say myosin thick filament. And here we have one single protein, and as you can see, it has two heads. And when we take a look at the actin thin filaments, we see that every single thin filament has like two strands of actin proteins. So these little balls that you're seeing here, each of these little purple balls is an actin protein. And these actin proteins are side by side, making a line, making a filament. And we have two filaments of actin proteins twisting, making something like a helix of actin proteins. Now, as you can see, this is the thin filament where we have the actin protein. And the great majority of the thin filament is actin protein. However, besides the actin protein, we find other proteins in the thin filament. And these proteins that we are seeing here are these and this. And these other proteins that are in the thin filament, they are not involved in the contraction per se. They are there to regulate contraction. 
That's why these two other proteins in the thin filaments are called regulatory proteins. They regulate if contraction will happen or not. And these regulatory proteins have names. This one is called troponin. And this one that looks like a thread is called tropomyosin. Now, we know that contraction happens because myosin pulls the actin. Exactly what we see in a molecular level is that the myosin head fits into this specific part of the actin protein that I drew as a black dot. Can you see that we have a black dot in each actin protein? Yes, that specific black dot in each actin protein receives the head of the myosin protein. And that specific part of the actin protein that the myosin head fits is called myosin binding site. Obviously, is the site in the actin protein at which the myosin head binds. Now, as you can see, all myosin binding sites of the actin proteins are covered by this protein that regulates contraction called tropomyosin. And what's keeping tropomyosin on top of the myosin binding sites of the actin protein is the other regulatory protein, which is called troponin. So the way I see this is troponin and tropomyosin, they are trap proteins. Troponin is a trap for actin and it traps actin in. Tropomyosin is a trap for myosin, and it traps myosin out. And it traps myosin out because tropomyosin does not allow the myosin heads to bind the myosin binding sites of the actin proteins. Now, when contraction is about to happen, we have the electrical impulse, the action potential, causing little sacs that store calcium inside the skeletal muscle cell to release calcium in the cytoplasm of the muscle cell. And when we have the calcium ions released in the cytoplasm of the muscle cell, the calcium ions combine with troponin. And when troponin is associated with a calcium ion, it changes its shape. And when troponin changes its shape, it moves tropomyosin out of the myosin binding sites. And when this happens, all myosin binding sites are now exposed and they are available for the myosin head to come and bind them. Now, in order for the myosin head to be able to bind the exposed myosin binding sites in the actin protein, we need ATP. We need energy. And we need energy for the myosin heads to be able to bind the myosin binding site in the actin protein. And we need energy for the myosin heads to release the myosin binding site in the actin protein. Consequently, we need at least two ATPs for this cycle to happen. One ATP for the myosin head to be able to bind and one ATP for the myosin head to be able to release the binding site. Now, every single time the myosin head is bound to the actin myosin binding site, we have a bridge between the actin and myosin proteins. And this bridge between the actin and myosin proteins is what we call cross bridge. And now you know why the recipe for muscle contraction is a muscle cell, a threshold stimulus, calcium ions, and ATP. We need the stimulus to cause the release of calcium ions into the cytoplasm of the muscle cell. When the calcium ions are in the cytoplasm of the muscle cell, we have calcium ions binding troponin, troponin change shape. When troponin change shape, it moves tropomyosin away from the myosin binding sites of the actin protein. When the myosin binding sites of the actin protein get exposed, and there is energy available, there is ATP available, the myosin head can go ahead and bind the myosin binding site in the actin protein. And then we have the myosin pulling the actin towards the middle of the sarcomere. Now, in order for the myosin head to release the myosin binding site, we need another ATP. And if this second ATP is not available, what do you think would happen? 
what would happen is the myosin head would not release the myosin binding site in the actin protein. And if the myosin head does not release the actin protein, we are in a state of rigidity. The muscle cannot stretch or contract. And that is exactly what happens in rigor mortis. When a person dies, cellular membranes become leakier. And if the cellular membranes become leakier, calcium ions that were hold in a little place of a muscle cell are capable of leak out. And with the increase of calcium ions in the cytoplasm of a muscle cell, we have troponin binding calcium ions. And then you know how it goes. Troponin binds calcium ions, it changes conformation, it changes its shape, that leads to tropomyosin moving out, moving away from the myosin binding sites. And then we have the myosin heads binding the myosin binding sites in the actin protein. Now, there was enough ATP for this binding to happen, but the person is dead. ATP is not being produced. Consequently, we do not have enough ATP for the myosin head to release the actin site. And then there is this rigidity in the body, which is rigor mortis. Now, after a certain amount of hours, rigor mortis goes away. And it just goes away because then we start having the degradation of the proteins in the dead body, including myosin and actin proteins are being degraded. And if the proteins are being degraded, there is no way we have this rigidity in the body. So it's always like this. A few hours after a person dies, there is rigor mortis. And then around 24 hours after the person died, rigor mortis goes away because the proteins around the body are being digested, including myosin and actin proteins. So now we know how a skeletal muscle cell contracts all the way down to the protein level. We know that the myosin thick filaments pull on the actin thin filaments. And for that to happen, we need to have calcium ions and ATP. Now, what triggers the release of calcium ions into the cytoplasm of the skeletal muscle cell is the presence of a threshold stimulus. And that's exactly what we'll be looking now. The first thing you need to remember is that a skeletal muscle cell is extremely long. It is basically the length of the skeletal muscle it is making up. And these that I drew here were three myofibrils. And as you can see, this is just a little segment of this skeletal muscle cell piece that we have here. Now, if you look at these lines, which are the myofibrils, and again, every single myofibril is made up of these sarcomere units, remember that? And every single sarcomere unit is made up of thin filaments and thick filaments. So when you look at these myofibrils right here, and you remember that this that I have right here is a little piece of this segment of a skeletal muscle cell, you can expect that these myofibrils will be extending to the sides. And that's exactly what we see. And these myofibrils extend to the sides and they are as long as the skeletal muscle cell they are part of. And if we go ahead and extend these myofibrils to the sides, it would look something like this. So now we have three myofibrils and they are extended to the sides, making reference that each myofibril is as long as the skeletal muscle cell it is part of. Now, here we only have three myofibrils. However, in a skeletal muscle cell, we have many more than three myofibrils. And if we would go ahead and make a cross-section right here, for example, in these three myofibrils, we would see something like this. We would see the top myofibril, the one that's right underneath it, and the bottom myofibril, just the three that we have here. But remember, we have many more than three inside of each skeletal muscle cell. Now, we know that each myofibril is composed of thick and thin filament. Remember that? Because a myofibril is a sequence of sarcomeres. So here we have the sarcomeres. So if we look at this cross-section of these three myofibrils, what we would see is thick filaments, right? Because inside of each sarcomere, we have thick filaments intercalated by thin filaments, correct? That is the arrangement of every single sarcomere. And these thick and thin filaments are the reason of why when we look at each sarcomere under a light microscope, we see the dark band and the light bands because that is a result of light passing or not passing through the thin or thick filaments. So I just drew right here a cross-section of these three myofibrils. 
But in reality, we would see many more than three. For example, we could see something like this. And in this case now, we have a skeletal muscle cell with seven myofibrils. And these myofibrils run the entire length of the skeletal muscle cell. Now, if this is a skeletal muscle cell with seven myofibrils within it, we can go ahead and draw the plasma membrane of this skeletal muscle cell. And this plasma membrane is exactly this that we had before. Now, in muscle cells, we have a special name for the plasma membrane. And the plasma membrane in muscle cells is called sarcolemma. And this space that we see right here between the myofibrils is the cytoplasm of the skeletal muscle cell. Now, the cytoplasm in a muscle cell also has a different name. And the cytoplasm is named sarcoplasm. And obviously, within the sarcoplasm, which is the cytoplasm of the skeletal muscle cell, we will find organelles such as mitochondria, which is extremely important for the production of ATP that we need for muscle contraction to happen. We will find in the cytoplasm, close to the periphery of the cell, we will find nuclei. Because every single skeletal muscle cell has several nuclei. Remember that? Now, another detail we observe in skeletal muscle cells is that the plasma membrane, which is called sarcolemma, and remember, the root sarco means flesh, right? So you have the sarcolemma, you have the sarcoplasm. Now, what we see in skeletal muscle cells is that the sarcolemma, so the plasma membrane of the skeletal muscle cell, invaginates and it goes deep within the cell. You need to look at these invaginations as the opposite of a microvilli. A microvilli sticks out and increases the surface area of a cell, and that's very helpful for absorption. Now, in the case of a skeletal muscle cell, we have the plasma membrane sticking into the cell. And when it sticks into the cell, whatever will cause a change in the plasma membrane of the specific skeletal muscle cell will invaginate, it will go deep within the skeletal muscle cell because the plasma membrane, the sarcolemma, is going deep into the cell. And since these invaginations are going through the skeletal muscle cell in a transverse way, and they look like tubules, we call these invaginations T-tubule. So as you can see, I drew a T-tubule right here, and I drew a T-tubule right there. Now, remember that this view right here is a cross-section, right? And if we go ahead and we look at T-tubules, not from a cross-section, this is what we would see. We would see the sarcolemma, the plasma membrane of the skeletal muscle cell, invaginating like this. And these are the T-tubules. As you can see, here we have one myofibril, right? And in the myofibril, we have a thin and thick filaments. So when you look at this, we can see that the T-tubules, which were named T because they go deep into the cell in a transverse, T for transverse way, we can see that each T-tubule has this blue structure on each side. Can you see that? These blue structures are containers that store calcium ions. And these containers receive the name of terminal cistern. And within each terminal cistern, we find calcium ions. Now, one T-tubule with a terminal cistern in one side and another terminal cistern on the other side adds to three. Three structures together. And that's the reason why one T-tubule and two terminal cisterns form what we call a triad. Like a tricycle has three wheels, a triad has three structures. It has one T-tubule and two terminal cisterns. And now we are finally ready to go over how a motor neuron triggers a skeletal muscle cell contraction. Skeletal muscles are the muscles that we have conscious control over them. And we consequently decide if we are going to contract or not on a specific skeletal muscle. And what arrives in the skeletal muscle cell is the terminal button, the end of an axon that belongs to a motor neuron, correct? 
because motor neurons are the neurons that cause motility. And you learned in the nervous tissue lecture that all motor neurons have a multipolar shape. And you learned in the spinal cord and spinal nerves lecture that somatic motor neurons, which are the neurons that innervate muscles that we can consciously control, have their neuronal cell body in the ventral gray horn of the spinal cord. And then we have the axon leaving the central nervous system and going all the way to the periphery. And at the end of the axon, we will have the terminal buttons that will synapse with the specific skeletal muscle cell. So this axon right here is the pathway through which an action potential, a nerve impulse, an electrical signal will flow until this stimulus reaches the terminal buttons of the axon. And the terminal buttons are filled with vesicles that have neurotransmitters inside. Now, let's zoom in right here. So here we have the sarcolemma, the plasma membrane of the skeletal muscle cell. Right here we have the invagination of the sarcolemma, which is what we call T-tubule. And we would see right next to the T-tubule, the terminal cisterns, which are filled up with calcium ions, right? This is the terminal button of a somatic motor neuron. And within the terminal button, we have vesicles filled with neurotransmitters. And as you learned in the nervous tissue lecture, when there is an stimulus, this stimulus is transduced, is transformed into an electrical signal because our body communicates via electrical signals and chemical signals. And this electrical signal is what we call an action potential or a nerve impulse. And that is literally the cell depolarizing. So when the cell is capable of changing from being polarized to being depolarized, from being more negative on the inside compared to the outside to become more positive on the inside in relationship to the outside. And this change in voltage is the electrical signal. And this electrical signal flows from the dendrites of the neuron past the neuronal cell body and then goes away in the axon of the neuron until it reaches the terminal buttons of the neuron. While this electrical signal was flowing through the nerve fiber, this electrical signal, which is a change in voltage, was causing the opening of voltage-gated channels. Those are channels found in the plasma membrane of the neuron that open due to a change in voltage. That's why they are called voltage-gated channels. And when this electrical signal, this change in voltage, arrives at the terminal button, it causes voltage-gated calcium ion channels to open. Those are calcium channels that open due to a change in voltage, voltage-gated calcium ion channels. And when the voltage-gated calcium ion channels in the terminal button open, they will allow calcium ions that are outside of the cell to flow into the terminal button, to flow inside the cell. And when there is this influx of calcium ions into the terminal button, that triggers the vesicles that have neurotransmitters inside them to fuse with the plasma membrane of the terminal button and release the neurotransmitters into this gap that we have between the neuron and the skeletal muscle cell. And these neurotransmitters are the chemical signals that transfer the information from the neuron to the skeletal muscle cell. Because remember, two excitable cells never touch, two neurons never touch, a neuron and a muscle cell never touch. There is always a gap. And what will transfer the information from one excitable cell to the other excitable cell are chemical signals, which are neurotransmitters. Now, the neurotransmitters that transfer the signal from a neuron to a skeletal muscle cell is called acetylcholine. And the short for acetylcholine is ACH. So acetylcholine released by the neuron flows through this gap, which is called synaptic gap or synaptic cleft. And these acetylcholine molecules bind acetylcholine receptors found in the skeletal muscle cell plasma membrane, which is called sarcolemma. Now, these acetylcholine receptors are channels 
and they are channels that they open when a chemical ligand, like a neurotransmitter, binds them. Since these channels only open when there is a chemical ligand binding them, they are called ligand-gated channels. And when the acetylcholine chemical ligand, the acetylcholine neurotransmitter molecules bind the acetylcholine receptors, which are the ligand-gated channels, the ligand-gated channels open. And when these ligand-gated channels open, sodium ions that were outside of the skeletal muscle cell go inside of the skeletal muscle cell through these ligand-gated channels. Consequently, these ligand-gated channels are allowing the influx of sodium ions. That's why these ligand-gated channels are called ligand-gated sodium ion channels. Because when they are open, due to the ligand binding the receptor, they allow sodium ions to pass through them. Now, the influx of sodium ions into the skeletal muscle cell is an influx of positive ions into the skeletal muscle cell. And that causes the inside of the cell to become more positive than the outside of the cell. It causes the depolarization of the skeletal muscle cell. And this change in voltage is an electrical signal. It is an action potential. So this influx of sodium ions causes, triggers, an action potential in the skeletal muscle cell. And this action potential flows through the sarcolemma. It flows through the plasma membrane of the skeletal muscle cell, including the part of the plasma membrane that goes deep into the skeletal muscle cell, which is what we call T-tubule. Now, the T-tubule, together with two terminal cisterns, one in each side, form a triad. And what happens is that as this change in voltage goes down into the T-tubules, goes deep down into the skeletal muscle cell, this change in voltage causes the opening of voltage-gated calcium ion channels that are present in the membrane of the terminal cisterns, which are containers that store calcium ions. And when these voltage-gated calcium ion channels open, calcium ions that were stored within the terminal cisterns are released into the cytoplasm of the skeletal muscle cell. Calcium ions are released into the sarcoplasm. And when calcium ions are released into the sarcoplasm, into the cytoplasm of the skeletal muscle cell, these calcium ions bind troponin, which changes conformation. Consequently, it moves tropomyosin out of the myosin binding sites of the actin protein. And now that the myosin binding sites of the actin protein are exposed, myosin can bind it. And when myosin binds the actin, it uses one ATP, and then it pulls the actin, thin filament, towards the center of the sarcomere, and then using another ATP, myosin detaches from the actin thin filament. And this is how our skeletal muscles contract. And with this, we finish the muscle tissue lecture. Please let me know if you have any questions, and I will see you in class. Bye!